we're going to talk about emergent leadership. In other words, how do leaders emerge, especially when there's no one in charge yet? We're going to look at some fascinating research on how people emerge in groups as leaders. And also, we're going to look at even where you should sit or not sit around a table if you want to be seen as an emerging leader. So stick around to the end for that bonus tip. Let's get into the details. So I'm working out of B.B. and Masterson's book on communicating in small groups. We're talking about small groups, but this original research was done in what's called the Minnesota Studies, and it was led by Ernest Borman. And he asked the question, who is most likely to emerge as the perceived leader of a leaderless discussion group? So they did experiments where they put a bunch of people together to have a discussion, and they wanted to see what were the small little moves that people made, individuals made, to emerge as the unofficial leader, the recognized leader of that group. So an emergent, uh, emergent leaders are those whose powers derive from their acceptance by the other group members rather than their position, rank, or status. So often at work, you'll have a supervisor who is in a leadership position. Sometimes, however, you're on a team where the leader has not emerged yet. There's no official leader. And this question remains, well, who becomes the leader in ambiguous situations like that? And what Borman and the other researchers found was there was a method of residues. That's what they called it. Essentially, it's the people who were not eliminated as ineffective group members. So it's the question of the last person standing becomes the group leader. So groups will often reject group members from the role of leadership until only one remains. So they look around the group and they say, not that person, not that person, not that person. Okay, I guess this is the only person left. They'll be our leader. So let's look at the specifics on how that happens. Group members reject potential leaders for these specific reasons. People who talk too much. So if you're long-winded, taking constant talking turns, they'll say to themselves, oh, I don't want that person in charge. I don't want to deal with that. Also, if they're too bossy or too dictatorial, so they want to be in charge of you really badly, they're like, nope, that's too much. That's too top down. Also, if they're verbally aggressive, so they come across as a little pushy, a little nasty with the way they talk to people. So these first three make a lot of sense. Why would I want someone in charge of me who demonstrates these qualities? So let's pivot a little bit because it changes. Also, they don't, we don't want leaders who are unable to contribute to the group's task goals because they're too quiet, vague, tentative, self-effacing, and they're always asking others for direction. Now, this makes sense too, because if you're someone who is really taking that back seat and you're, you're too not confident enough to speak up and to make a contribution, then people won't see you as a leader. That, those just are not obvious leadership qualities. Also, if you're too concerned about everybody's feelings to be decisive. So as we'll see in a moment, you have to be concerned with people's feelings, but not so concerned with everybody that you can't move forward. You can't be decisive. So those are some reasons why we eliminate people for our potential leaders when we're in a leaderless group. So group members value these strengths with their potential leaders. This is what we want in a potential leader of our group someone who demonstrates individual task effectiveness. So you have to be good at your job. You have to be good at what you do as an individual on the team. Make your deadlines, follow through on what you said you were gonna do. You also have to show commitment to the group's goals. So you're good individually, but also you're committed to making the group's goals move forward. You tend to be more extroverted. That means you're willing to speak up. Introverted people sometimes are waiting a little too long to speak up. And if you're waiting too long to speak up, you might not demonstrate yourself as a leader. So the, the little side tip here is that if, if you're introverted, make sure you push yourself a little more earlier in group meetings to break the ice and to say something early on to be seen as someone who's a potential leader. Someone who demonstrates effective listening skills is another key quality. You have to listen well to others. You have to listen and bring in what they're saying, make good eye contact, nod, all those good listening skills that we learned in school. You wanna provide an optimum blend of efficiency on the task, but also personal consideration. So you have to be good at tasks, but also show what we call consideration, respect, politeness, care, and kindness for the other people around you. You have to balance that. There's an important mixture there to be seen as an emerging leader. And you have to be seen as embodying the group's social identity, especially when uncertainty is high. So if the group's really not sure of what's going on, if 
if the direction is not clear, you're more likely to emerge as a leader if you stand for what the group is supposed to stand for. So when uncertainty is high, it's very likely that an outsider, for example, someone who's kind of thinking of, well, they're, they're a unique individual, they might not align with the group's core values and identity, so they would not be selected as a leader. You have to stand for what the group stands for to be considered a leader. So let's turn to seating. Now, this is sort of a bonus tip, not part of Borman's research, but some research that I found fascinating in the book from B.B. and Masterson on communicating in small groups. So let's say you're seated around a table that looks something like this. Obviously, the most common place for the leader to naturally sit would be the head of the table. But the reason they sit at the head of the table is not just because they want to be seen as someone who's powerful. It's because from this position, you can make the most eye contact and connect non-verbally with all the other people. You can see everybody from here. And also from that position, you can direct the flow of traffic. You can pull people in and out of the discussion as needed. So that's the leader's spot for very practical reasons. So let's say you're in a group with no leader and you have a choice to where to sit. One of the places you could sit would be the head of the table. If you're at the head of the table, you can subtly influence and drive the discussion simply because people are looking at you most. So let's say, however, that this position is taken by somebody or perhaps taken by someone who's already the official leader. Where should you sit next? I think that's the key question for most of us. Sitting at the head of the table is obvious. Where should you sit next? Well, the best seats for your second option are these two on the right. For the same exact reasons that the head of the table is a good position. From these seats, you can see everybody else at the table. You can see four other people. That's four other people that can make eye contact with you, that can see you listening carefully, that's the majority of the group now that's able to connect with you. And if they can see you participating, contributing, looking at them, listening well, they can see that you have these potential leadership qualities. In contrast, the worst places to sit are where the opposite is true. The worst places are these other corners on the left side. Because from these positions, it's very hard to make eye contact with more than a couple of people. It's very hard to direct any kind of communication track traffic from here. And even if you are non-verbally contributing from these seats, very few people can see it. So if you want to become a leader, don't sit in the corners. If you want to be a leader, sit where everybody can see you and you can see everybody. And that those principles apply regardless of the shape of the table and the style of meeting and seating arrangement. Sit where you can see everybody and they can see you. Now, Sometimes I will personally decide to sit in the corners because I know about this research on purpose. And it's when I'm already, I'm a leader in my job. I'm the supervisor, the chair of my department. And when I go to bigger meetings, sometimes I think, man, I, I just cannot take one more assignment, one more project. So I will put myself deliberately in the corner. I'll be a little quiet that meeting. And sure enough, when I have sat in the corners, almost nobody looks at me, asks me questions, and gives me more work to lead. So sometimes you can use this strategically, but if you wanna be a leader, an emerging leader, sit where the most people can see you. So here are some key takeaways. Demonstrate your individual effectiveness on tasks. You have to be seen as a competent individual first and foremost. Show your commitment to the group's goals. Speak up, but don't be dominant, aggressive, or long-winded. Listen well, show consideration for others, and as a bonus tip, sit where you can make eye contact with the most amount of people. So question of the day, which of these tips do you find most interesting? I would love to hear your comments in that section below, and what could you put into practice, for example, in your own professional situations to become an emerging leader, to be seen as maybe the next leader of that group? I look forward to reading those comments. So thanks, take care, and I will see you soon.